All right, here we go. Podcasting time. Glenn Power is here in the Rove Hotel, downtown Dubai's epic podcast studio. Glenn Power, PowerWorks Automotive, The Garage, the Mr. Fix-It of all things rolling on wheels is in the house. The master of the one-hand text message now. <laughs> Honestly, repetitive strain injury is real. If you're watching on the YouTube, you can see that he was answering the messages. The phone was going off. The fact that he's you've taken time away from the wrenches to come and sit down and have a chat, I really appreciate it. Well, this is, you know, this is what we do. Yeah. This actually was the, the the sort of pioneering moment in my entrepreneurial vision. There we go. Up until the point of contacting, I forget the lady's name now. Sue, um, you, you contacted Sue. Uh, 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 ARN. Yeah, Sue Perry. That's right. Until I'm, that moment, I never ever thought that I wanted to have my own garage. And then we sat down, we had a chat. Yeah. Started talking. Yeah. And followed your entrepreneurial path through our you know hour a week having a chat about yeah, cars yeah but until i did it until i until i started doing the radio i never thought you know what i'd like to do this on my own sometimes i'm still not sure that i do want to do it on my own but i'm there now it's aren't like, I? like many things right you can't turn back now oh no 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 <laughs> no well, we're, we're, look, we're talking cars. You tune into the podcast, you you know that it goes off in all sorts of directions. But essentially, I like to think of this hour as the essential education you need to keep your car rolling, to have peace of mind when you're driving around, and have peace of mind when you have to go get your automobile fixed. Because they all need to be fixed at some point. Even if you've got warranty, it's still going to have to be fixed at some point. You're going to get a flat. You're going to have some brake issues. You're gonna, something's yeah. going to happen. You're going to get into a crash. You're going to need to talk to someone. Yeah. And this way, you know the basics. That's right. It's kind of like, you know, this this, this serves as almost the, the minor service on your vehicle. <laughs> there we go. Give you, a, give, give you a bit more information by the end of it, hopefully. <laughs> I, I want to kick off because the, the back story here is we put together a, a set of notes and... You send me some stuff that's come to your mind. I put some stuff in, and we it, it sort of goes through the ringer, and we come up with a show. We forget the notes, and then often, and on. often something will happen on the drive in, like today, which will then trigger a whole bunch of ideas, and we'll get back to the notes. And and so, but no, we we got we've got some great stuff, and I want to I want to kick off with the pollen filters, uh. and you sent me an image. Still from, scarred. From a car. Still scarred. And this is kind of an important thing because our, our the cabins of cars today, vehicles, are really a closed environment, depending on, of course, the kind you own and, and how high up the food chain or the price chain you're going. They're, they're, the cabin of your cars is a closed environment that has a pretty complex air conditioning, heating, air circulation, filtration system built into it. Now... When you think of your home air filtration, when you think of the office, the HVAC, and all these things, there are filters. You sent me this image of a filter that needed to be changed, that was being changed, but the manufacturer, and we're talking, this is Ford, had not clearly thought out the idea that someone might actually want to change the filter. Well, they're recidivists as well, because this isn't the first vehicle from Ford that's had this problem. So on the Focus, you have to take the accelerator pedal out right, to get to the filter that comes out on the driver's now, side. Does, is it just a, a little you know, a little clip that you undo? No. And it come, no. 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 <laughs> no. And there's a plastic wiring connector, obviously, which breaks. So then you do the pollen filter, and then the car won't move. And right. there's an engine light on. But this was an eco sport, and it was a very good friend of mine. And he owns a Turkish restaurant here in the UAE called Grand Bazaar. So a little bit of a plug for him. Mm. But he's a good friend, known him for a long time. First met him when he had a 2006 XKR Jaguar. Really nice car it was. Um, He had nothing but trouble with it. It was a Jaguar. But every time you talk about Jaguars, the word trouble comes in i mean the beautiful cars people love them you, you own it you'll do anything for it but they it, 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 there's always a but attached every to it. single person i know that's owned one or owns one 
the, the, the best analogy that we've come up with as a collective has always been sort of looking at them as almost the uh, the ex that got away. Right. They just are obsessed with them. Yeah. And I get it. I've driven many of them. Driven yeah. many of them. They're beautiful. I mean, you get they it. look it's nice. <sighs> they drive nice most of the time. So I get it. I understand why people like them. But, man, are they trouble, especially in this yeah. climate. But anyway, so that's how I knew him. I'd known him for nine years, almost as long as I've been here. And his wife has a Ford EcoSport, so oh. uh, just and just a commute. A great, great little car. They are nothing they wrong are. with it. It does great. They're wonderful fuel economy. Yeah, they look kind of cool. They, you know, they you do know, the job. Plenty of space in there for 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 four grown adults, which is good and no problem. Yeah. Right, comes in for a service. So me and DJ do the service for him. Great guy, good friend. So we'll go round, do all his blacks, yeah. uh, plastics, all the bumper. We rub all that in with peanut oil, make it black again because it had gone grey. Right. We polished his headlights. We did a full service on it. Do everything while it's up on the lift. The last job is the pollen filter because it's under the dashboard. Now I'm accidentally trying to find other things to do. <laughs> Keep looking at my phone. Is it ringing? to someone ring? You know, DJ can go and do this. Nobody rings me. Nobody's yeah. messaged me. Nobody has a problem. I'm just going to have to do it. DJ's sweating, rubbing the peanut oil into the bumper black. So what can I do? Where, now, hold on. I got a question about peanut oil. Where are you getting your peanut oil? Peanuts. So you're making it? No, no. no, it's, no. Uh, <laughs> we, we buy it from the little supermarket over the road. Okay. So you can get back to black, which is like a no, bumper No, no, but uh, the, the reason I'm asking about peanut oil is that's great oil for doing some frying. And yeah, I've been, yeah. I've been looking for peanut oil and I yeah, couldn't yeah. find we it. We just get it from the shop over there. Another one that works is mustard oil, but it sometimes smells a bit... Yeah, No, well, no, I'm back mustardy. to the peanut oil for frying. I'm going to come by the shop to get yeah, some okay. peanut oil. So the, sh- the corner shop over the road from us. Yeah. <sighs> okay, good. So anyway. if, And if you want to do it at home and you haven't got peanut oil, just uh, smooth peanut butter is fine. So if you rub smooth peanut butter Put a little butter bit on, of jam there too. Then, you well, I wouldn't go for the jam. <laughs> but you can wipe the peanut butter off and it'll do the same job. All right. So anyway, that's been done. Yeah. DJ's done that. He's sweating. <laughs> it's only 18 degrees. It's winter. He's still sweating because that's just not a nice job. Okay, I'll do the pollen filter then. Seven did you, screws Did you later. know what you were in for? When, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I was deliberately okay. hanging back. Seven screws. So yeah. right off the bat, I'm going, come on. Like, yeah. I mean, this sounds to me... All different heads as well. Oh no! So no. you know, it's not like so. Some so on a. So is this like a retrofit or something? Like it? Sh- no, no, this no. Is this factory. is like they've got a HVAC unit, HVAC unit, and they've just made it fit an eco spot. Okay. And then it's ah, okay. <laughs> well, this is so. And I'm just going to put my hands up here. So around the center console, where your gear lever and your handbrake is. Yeah. Yeah. And the Eagle Sports, it's it's a it's a nice compact vehicle. Yeah, yeah, very compact. Yeah, yeah but it's got really massive doors. Yes. So you've got to get it off the ramp, doors all the way open, and then you've got this freak frame laid in there <laughs> trying to work on it. You know, it's just not happening, but it had to be done. So the center console has nice finishing trim. So when you sat in your driver's seat or passenger seat in the footwell, it's finished. You can't yeah. see the frame of the dashboard or anything. It's nice. Now that trim, for whatever reason is one piece that goes all the way to the back. Nice. And to remove it, I've got to get the seat out. So I didn't. Okay. I bent it out of the way. Uh-huh. Probably shouldn't have. I asked him. I said, F.A., can I do it this way? He's saying, no, don't change it. Don't change it, bro. That was his words. I was, no, 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 you've got to have it changed, but I'm just telling you, I'm going to bend it. Yeah. Don't panic. It'll be fine. It'll go back in place. It's held in by this massive bolt. It's going to be in place. Don't yeah. worry. So these seven screws have all got different heads. So I've got two different screwdrivers in there to get them out. And then the trim's all the way out. So now I've got no space because the trim's in my way, but it's either that or take the seat and the the trim's on the top of the gear lever out to get this trim off. I'm not doing that. So then I'm going in there. There's then three screws that hold a cover in to hold the filter in and keep it sealed. Three. Three. These screws have got green paint on them, which have come when they've assembled the HVAC unit yeah. to make sure that they're torqued. You paint yeah. them up, say you've torqued them. This paint mark is still there and hasn't been disturbed. This car is four, five years old. It's never had a pollen filter change. Even in the dealer, they didn't change the you, filter on it. And you know why? I know because why. It takes the seven guys screw- are on bonus. Yeah. It takes seven screws. You've got to remove them. Yeah. 
I know why. Yeah. I've still got the scars. <laughs> my hands are covered in them. So I'm real mad at this point. Yeah. So I'm like, the dealer's not even changing it. Why am I in here doing this? Yeah. So I'm chuntering to myself. DJ now has finished his job and he's behind me just laughing. Because why wouldn't you? But I'd have been laughing at him. In fact, what I'd have been doing to him is I'd have been starting the car and putting the heating on onto the footwell <laughs> to make it worse, which we did used to do to each other. But, you know, yeah. that, that's that's for another day. So anyway, then the filter comes out. Uh-huh. Two centimetres. What? An inch, maybe. Only two centimetres? And then it's touching the glove box and the rest of the dashboard frame. So I've then got to tear it and bend it to get it out. That's no problem. It's getting thrown away because it's going to be changed, yeah, right? Yeah, but you've got to put one back in. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it's not like, you know... You it's get, not like you, you can tear and bend and then You get it. a ring stuck on your finger and put a bit of soap and it'll... Cook. No, yeah. you can't put soap on a paper filter. It ain't helping anybody. So what'd you do? Got angry. <laughs> of course. Just squashed it. Now, they're concertina a bit like uh, uh, an accordion, right? Yeah, of course. So squashed it down and bent it in. But the airflow is one direction. And there are no markings on the filter to tell me which way the air blows. No. <laughs> so I've then got to work it out by the, the fleck on the paper. <laughs> so then we get it in. Yeah, so, uh, so it's how- highly amusing to everyone else. But, I mean... So clearly, if the dealer isn't changing it, these filters just don't get changed. Like there's, it's you know, we're not changing these Polo filters. All I can say is I'm glad it wasn't a right-hand drive car because then I'd have had the same deal. I'd have had to have if it was a manual clutch pedal out. Yeah, and uh, the, the brake pedal isn't coming out without massive work, so you just got less space. So what an absolute pain! How long did how long did this job take you? Better part now. I did stop a couple of times to scream into a pillow and go back and get another screwdriver yeah. but best part of an hour yeah that's a lot of time yeah better part of an hour and the yeah. and the, the phone the, ringing and message yeah. and stuff but, but realistically you know yeah, 30 terrible. minutes is what you're going to be yeah. spending on it that's a lot of time these things should just slide out i mean now is, yeah. is do you think it was right at the point where pollen filters became this this idea that you know what we really need to be swapping these in and out more often and they oh. just hadn't thought about it at that no, point no 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 because no. this car isn't what what was this 2016 when the eco sport yeah. first arrived 2017 oh, oh, yeah so no we we're thinking of it i mean it's a filter you can put it in out so okay yeah because they're clearly cars no, since the 80s clearly no one's taken that filter out i mean it's way too hard you know you think of a dealer yeah a, a retailer technician that's on a massive <laughs> massive incentive plus <laughs> yeah also is monitored on an efficiency and you probably get I don't know on a on a in our region you're changing your bottom filter every service because how dusty it is mm-hmm. was this one pretty dirty horrific yeah of course never been changed it was really really bad and they have a dog oh <gasps> So you got dander. So there, every now and again, there's like you know, there's there's down in you know whatever you want to call it, it's, it's yeah. everywhere. The bottom of it, down in the bottom, is just thick. You know? and I, I think this is a good reminder to people that many cars do have pollen filters, and you need to change them. Yeah, yeah. Every every service, you need to get in and just like they clean out your air filter in your in your engine, you need to get that pollen filter cleaned. Yeah, the the one that we used to get in the UK, which was. When I was at VW, which was a difficult one, was not difficult once you knew, was the Beetle. And the first time yeah. I got one to do, it was the new Beetle. The first time I got one to do, um, Graham said to me, go on and change the pollen filter. Yeah. And he threw it at me. Yeah. I'm looking for it. Now, at this, this generation, Mark IV Golf and 3B Passat, yeah. this is when pollen filters were outside of the car. Under the what? under the bonnet, oh, okay. inside the scroll well, panel. At least it's easy to get to. Real easy. Yeah. Get now in, the Passat get... had other issues because the the seal around the bottom used to leak and the water right, went yeah. in and the alarm used to go off. Of other which we used, we had a recall on. Yeah. But they're outside the car and easy to change. The Beetle is based on the Golf. So I'm under the bonnet. Oh, there's no space here. <laughs> it's not in here. I'm under the dashboard where the others were starting to be put. Yeah. It's not there. <laughs> I've got no idea. By this point, everyone's been told that the apprentice is looking for a pollen filter on a beetle and everyone's over having a laugh. <laughs> you know, DJ probably told me it was in the back or something, you know, and I probably would have listened to him. But it's under the dashboard on right. the top. So you've got to take the top of the dashboard off. Now, it sounds bad and it's not great, but 
with one screwdriver, there's a fair few screws, but they're all the same. Right. The rest of the dashboard are held on with different ones, but because this is a job that will be done regularly, they made the screws the same. And once you've knocked the trim off the top, it's real simple. Yeah. So once you know, and you could change one of those in 10 minutes. You need one screwdriver, well, actually a quarter drive ratchet because one of them's right at the front and you've got no length because of the angle of the screen. Yeah, of course. But, you know, this comes down to the fact that the EcoSport is a an economical car. Oh, you know? and that's it. They're thinking, how long is it going to last? Yeah. How long are you going to keep it? You're yeah. going to move it on. Pfft, do we really? It, yeah. And which drives me bananas because whether I'm spending, you know, obscene amounts of money or whether I'm spending a reasonable amount of money, those basic things should be universal that you can get at the filters, the pollen filter for the cabin to change it. Yeah. So we have good driving health, which is going to transcend over into yeah. our, everything else we do. Not going to happen, though, is it? So. I, they just cheap out. I mean, and I, I'm not... There's reasons for it. Yeah, it's, you know, economies of scale. I mean, if yeah. you think about R&D required just for a HVAC unit for an EcoSport, which they're probably making the smallest margin of any car they sell on, right? is it worth it? No. Have we got something in line already that we can kind of shrink down or shave a bit off and make it fit? Yeah, okay, we'll use that, and then we can meet a yeah. price point because it's aimed at a certain price point. Yeah. Fair enough. I understand, but... The engineer, he or she that stood on that production line, putting that in that, I hope, and I'm sure they were, shaking the head yeah. when the dashboard went in, thinking that's ridiculous, what a bad yeah. idea that is. He only needed to, you know, if it had been, well, it is what it is, done. It's, it, it, it's just, it happens with a lot of a lot of situations on cars where you, you can yeah. see, we've said before, engineers design them and accountants approve them. Yeah. And we're left with something in the middle, which somewhere. usually doesn't a, benefit the technician. Yeah, we need a compromise. Yeah. yeah. The interesting one this morning on the on the drive into the studio here is I was behind. It was another Ford, and this has got nothing to do with the the car. This is it was a I don't know what even kind of what Ford it was. It was an economy vehicle that clearly been driven badly <laughs> because. So I'm, I'm behind it in the Wrangler, and I'm just looking at this thing. And I'm looking at the, with the wheels because it just didn't look right. And you had all th- you had four, three of the wheels were rolling as they should, and the, the rear driver's side wheel yep. was on an angle. And, and I was, I thought, okay, maybe it's just an optical illusion. So because I was behind it for, you know, a good 10 kilometers. Oh, no, no. It was not, it, and I, you know, because then I'm, I'm veering over a little bit. So, I, you know, I look kind of like I'm driving on the phone. I'm not. Was, but, you know, clearly people would have thought I was texting because I'm just trying to get a, a different yeah. angle. I'm going, no, no, this thing. It, so then all I'm thinking, having driven in vehicles that need tires and, and stuff and given the type of vehicle that I drive, I'm going, that must be a weird ride inside. <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking because instead of the, the tire being like this, it was like this. So I'm even trying to figure out on the tread of the tire or the tread wear that must be going on. It, it just, what, what, what was I looking at? What did I see? Well, what's happened there is either something, for it to be one side, something's been hit and bent. Yeah, I figure out. it was you, a curb. Think, I think they curbed it yeah, or something. Yeah, we, we've got a, countless numbers of cars that come to us like that. And yeah. a lot of the time, unfortunately, and you can understand why people say, oh, no, I haven't hit anything. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm a bit, you know, I'm a bit embarrassed. You know? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes they've got bloodshot eyes and very tired and smell of a certain drink and you yeah. think, mm. Mm. But, you know, these things happen and people do hit curbs. And the problem is you need to get that fixed straight away. Nothing works now on that car. Right. See, the anti-lock brakes, the traction control all require a wheel speed. And if the wheel isn't rotating correctly, it's rotating at the wrong speed. And the vehicle will detect that and think there's something wrong, which mm. there is. So there's probably warning lights on the dash of that I vehicle. I would think almost certainly, yeah. yeah. Now, the problem with it being one of the front ones is that your steering feels funny and yeah. you're constantly adjusting. So you're going to go get that you're fixed. in control of the steering yeah. wheel. So you're going to go get that fixed sooner than later. Definitely, whether it's front or rear. But when it's one of the rear ones, you might not even necessarily know. Ah. So what's happening is the steering wheel won't be straight because the back of the car is, is pushing the front of the car, although it's right. actually usually in a front-wheel drive, front engine, the front of the car is pulling the rear. But the back is what squares the wheel. The back is less adjustable 
right. and certainly not adjustable by the driver. So you set the wheel alignment of the vehicle basically to the back. The mm. geometry is based on the back being straight. And if the back isn't straight, the front will be way out. Okay. So you'll see sometimes you'll see cars that are a bit twisted. Older cars, they'll be yeah. called crabbing because they're sat. So yeah, the yeah. back's following the front three or four feet to the left. Yeah, or I've, seen, I've seen a few of those yeah, recently yeah. too. So it happens on the Wrangler a lot, actually, when people jack them up and they get different uh, panard rods and what have you for the, for the diff tubes and everything. But then they'll get adjusted all the way over one way because they'll go over a bump and get air and yeah. it'll shift into place and it never comes back. Right. But this, in the case of one wheel like that, would almost certainly have hit a curb or maybe been parked at the side of the road and something's hit that. Yeah. But the problem is... Well, a piece of retread that's, you know, someone's blown a tire and they haven't cleaned it up yet yeah, and yeah. you don't see it and you hit it. and I mean, you It's know. easy enough at speed to do yeah. quite serious damage. And a lot of cars now, they have multi-link suspension, let's say. So there's more okay, than okay. just... Explain that. Explain so, that a little bit. So basically, we're not talking about the old days. Like you go and think of an old American muscle car. Everyone says, yeah, they're all right on a straight line. They can't turn corners because they've got no <laughs> suspension. They've got a tube with a diff in it and some leaf yeah. springs. Yeah. Now you've got wishbones on the top and on the bottom. You've got trailing arms, you, whichever way you want to It's just them. complicated. It's complicated. So there's, there's more than one thing that can bend. Okay. A lot of them have um, disc brakes. And you've got disc brakes. You've often got a hub with a bearing inside it. Then that's onto a hub carrier or a steering knuckle, whichever way you want to call it. That can bend and break and does. Um that hub carrier might have four links or five even on it for suspension. Oh, Any okay. one of those or all of those or a combination of a mix between can bend or break. Once they've bent, they don't bend back. All right. So it's impossible. Also, what can happen is, now, in the old days, you'd have something called um, swivel axis inclination, kingpin inclination, basically referring to certain angles on the steering. You don't get that now. Oh, really? Th- th- that's, that's an old thing. It's just gone. As close as you get to that is caster, but caster is now 90% of the time is not an adjustable angle. And caster basically refers to everyone's pushed a shopping trolley in a supermarket. Yeah. yeah. So the castered wheels, you've got them on office chairs, you've got them on whatever. Uh, the ones that flap around and you can't get a trolley to go straight is because there's something wrong with the caster wheel. Now, that is the angle. If you imagine the wheel and then you take the centre of the wheel, if you were to go straight up, that is basically neutral. And then if you were to go left or right, you're applying positive or negative, if you want to think of it that way, in terms of caster. And that's the angle that the suspension strut, as we you'd call it a damper spring, um, at first and stroke, whatever it may be, is angled at. So whether it's pulling right. the wheel or pushing the wheel. Okay, so when you look under and you see the suspension, they're often not straight up. They are often on. Yeah, but nobody really, you think of it as that way. But there's also the other aspect of it, looking from behind the wheel. So right. then the, the angle goes that way, straight, or in a very bad accident, that way, which is possibly what's happened there. Okay. The wheel gets hit. And that bends in the turret at the top. Now, if that's happened, that's a serious, serious repair that requires an alignment jig and the body needs to be aligned properly to the chassis again. And sometimes it's not doable without a massive, massive work, which is oftentimes uneconomical to to do. So the, these things from a very innocuous accident or seemingly innocuous accident can cause massive problems. And if you don't fix them, it's not a case of, things might happen it's a case of things will and they're happening straight away so you've got your tire wearing out first mm. traction control and abs won't work the brakes are under different loads they will wear out unevenly very very quickly they may even seize on mm. the tire is getting dragged not only is it wearing out quicker but it's getting a lot hotter because of the extra friction so the pressures are uneven and these all snowball and you'll end up with a situation where you might try and stop in an emergency and the car will pull quickly to one side. Yep. You'll hit something you were trying to avoid or whatever it may be. So any hit to a curb, even if you do it and you drive down the road for 100 metres and think, oh, got away with that one, go and get it checked, especially on modern vehicles that have electric steering because they'll sometimes be able to sort themselves out with the steering angle sensor and make it right. seem like they're driving straight. Yeah. Okay. Go and get it checked because you might have a problem. You, you, even at, at 
the very best case in the in case of hitting a curb is that nothing's gone wrong. But it's better to know that. And the very worst case, obviously, you damage everything. That's shocking in terms of yeah. having to spend money. But the very worst case is it seems like everything's okay and you've put a big dent in the side of one of your tyres. That tyre now has a weak point in it and uh. it's going to explode if you fill it with with air or get it too hot on the road or hit something else or go over a piece of blown out tyre yeah. or a stone or even anything on the road. If you go over it at the right time on the right rotation, it's going to burst. That's a problem. I, got, I got a, actually got a question about tyres. And there, there is a huge price differential between you know going for the brands, you know, like the Continentals, the Pirellis, the Yokohamas, yeah. etc. And then you you go down to things like Pirellis or Nexus or yeah. and is there a huge difference in those tires? The key thing to remember, um, we've mentioned this already. The key thing to remember with a branded tire is. Big brands are the ones that do the R&D. Okay. So the big brands are the ones that design from scratch the tyres, often by order or commission of a mm. manufacturer of a vehicle. They spend millions designing them. Which is why there's a cost differential. Of course. But there's also the fact that, well, we're, for example, Continental. Yeah. We can charge because we have a proven track record through hundreds of years of motorsport and blah, blah, blah of right. what we can do. We can charge. That's that's the reason Lamborghini charge what they do for a Lamborghini. Mm. They can, yeah. you know. So there's also a kind of brand value to associate. But the most of the cost is the R and D. The materials, the raw materials, pretty much standard all over the world. Oftentimes, you'll get a situation where, well, if I was to say to you Dunlop, no. everyone knows Dunlop. Everyone knows Dunlop. If I was to say Sumitomo, people would think. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Dunlop is owned by Sumitomo, and the Sumitomo tyres are made by the same people, therefore. Right, so you get the same thing. So it's effectively the mm. same thing. Now they have, you know, there's separation between tread patterns, and they they do differentiate. Which them. is where a whole bunch of research goes in, because different tread patterns and the different tread yeah. designs lead to a different ride. Yeah, exactly. Now, the other thing with tyres is manufacturers will give approval to use them. So take a Porsche. Yeah. If you have a Porsche, the tyre will have the normal size and it will have the whatever it is, but it will have a designation at the end, N1. N1 is the designation to say that that's approved by Porsche as being fitted from the factory or an equivalent of. Okay. um, Audi's AO, Mercedes MO. So Audi, some of the RS, Audi's are RO. So some of the high performance cars, RO. Now this again adds a premium to the tyre. Because there's a lot of stuff that manufacturer of that tire has to do to meet the requirements of Volkswagen Group for them mm. to say, yeah, you can put an okay. approval on that. Never thought of that. So there's a lot of that there. But then take a, you mentioned Pearly, a Chinese manufactured tire, and a lot of these tires are manufactured in China anyway. But take Pearly as an example. They can effectively reverse engineer an already existing tire with very little cost. Yeah. And not to say copy, but replicate that in a more economical way. Mm by producing them in higher numbers, by not necessarily going to the manufacturer for approvals, and that reduces their cost of production, and then the scale of economy, you know, again yeah. means that they can keep the price down. And there aren't always that many differences from tyre to tyre that we as standard road cars just driving to and from work would ever notice. Right. Put them in the hands of a racing driver on a racetrack, and then there's differences yeah. that will be picked up very, very quickly. Yeah. So tyres are so important that it's always worth a chat with whoever's supplying the tyres as to, okay, what do you recommend here? Uh, you mentioned Nexon there. Nexon's a good brand and it's it's on the up and up really. It's been more and more well recognised. It's got sponsorship deals with with a lot of um, sporting clubs. I think Manchester City mm. are um, sponsored by Nexon tyres. So it's, it's, it's well recognised. Apollo tyres in the UK is quite a, a, a popular brand now because they, they're affiliated with Manchester United okay. Football Club, which again, so the, the, the Apollos. So people get to know the name and think, well, it must be okay if, uh, if United have put, it, yeah. exactly. So these things happen with tyre brands, but ultimately that comes down to the fact that a tyre is kind of a tyre. Yeah. Um, 
for a normal road use, just make sure that you can trace it. Make sure that there's some form of where's this come from? Mm. You know, is there a warranty with it? Right. Get it from a reputed yeah. you know, outlet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And but ask the question. Ask the right yeah. question. If you can't get the answers, don't buy the tire. There we go. You know, that's yeah. it. And it's 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 no different to if you're going to buy a used car and, and you ask, has it been in an accident? And they say, oh, flat out, no. And then you check and it has. Well, it doesn't matter how minor it was. You can't trust that person. No, it's you, the same with the tires. You need the paint thickness tester that you walk around it. And just, Colin does that all the time. He does that. He's a paint thickness guy. He's obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> just does it for fun in any parking lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just likes getting his tool out. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. Uh, look, I, I, we 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 talked a little bit about Ford earlier, and and look, I I don't want to come across anything negative about Ford at all because no, no, that issue with the pollen filter is not yeah. exclusive to Ford. It's no. just that the story I had that was so. The reason I bring this up is I I was I came across some material that Ford with technology that Ford has got through and uh, it's a little bit dated but actually the the time of that they went through for a patent in 2018 we're 2022 now and some of this patent application has come into life and it has to do with manual transmissions and an electric clutch and so I started reading about this and I thought okay this is sounding interesting and it's sounding a little bit like something out of Star Wars too so I thought this is kind of cool and if you're watching the Tales of Boba Fett or Mandalorian, no. then it kind of fits in. But so this, and I thought you must might find this really interesting. And so it's talking about this electric clutch that yeah. uses sensors built into the shift knob to help decide how the thing's going to clutch. And it says, and it goes on to say, so you know, what are you talking about, James? You don't know anything about cars. So Glenn will explain this to us. But he says, however, and then I'm just reading right from the article. It says, however, according to the patent, the electric control of which might be a dry friction clutch, because they don't know, can be fine-tuned based on the shift knob shell, which is flexible, at least in some areas, allowing the driver to slightly deform, i.e. crush the knob, and in certain applications, the magnitude of squeeze applied by the driver could mimic working a clutch pedal and a harder squeeze, uh, you know, decoupling the clutch and softer ones doing the opposite. So essentially, no foot clutch, doing everything with the the squeeze of the fingers. Yeah, great for racing drivers. And I just thought, yeah, interesting. Now, it is... A fantastic innovation however the issue with it is when i drive a manual i often have my hand which in the uk would have been my left hand here is my right hand sat on the gear lever yeah. if there's some give or some kind of haptic feedback you're just going to constantly be there just like well, squeezing <laughs> on the end of the gear lever <laughs> and then the car's just going to be clutching all the time yeah and also I usually turn all that haptic stuff off. I can well, only deal yeah. with it for a little while. But also, not only that, what happens, what's the fail safe? Yeah. How, what, uh, yeah. You know, is, there, is there like a clutch pedal in the glove box and you just... Uh, maybe. <laughs> what's the fail yeah. safe? Because that, that, that unfortunately, being a mechanic, we only see cars that go wrong normally. So like, I, I, I almost think that way. I almost wondered if it had like a switch where you can just go fully automatic and yeah. boom. So yeah. fail safe is it just drives on. I mean, I, the only problem with it is it, any kind of electronic clutch activation always makes me think of Selly speed out of a Alpha or Fiat, yeah, which is awful, or the SMG out of the BMW, which again is awful. It's like somebody's changing the clutch on their first driving lesson. They're changing the gear on their first driving lesson. You can on the M stuff on the BMWs, you can change how quick or slow or soft or hard it does it, but it's still like being sat in a car with someone on the first driving lesson. It's yeah. just horrible and it's unnecessary. Just get a double clutch gearbox. Yeah. I mean, I, there you you know, just just get a PDK <laughs> or DSG, which Estronic, whichever way you want to call it. And you know, most the Ford one actually, the Ford one is good. But when we drove the black edition Mustang, oh man, the the, the double shift was great. Yeah. Didn't have a problem with it. No. This is totally unnecessary. And I don't think... It I wonder... Ever get I mean, it. But for racing drivers. Yeah. So for racing drivers, no problem. I, I don't understand why you'd need the clutch to clear further. Yeah. It's either cleared or it hasn't. And if you're doing a fast gear change, you're probably going to grab harder. 
So if you're driving fast, you're going to be holding harder. So you're going to squeeze harder. So you're going to pull harder. So you want that clutch to have gone less distance to make the gear change quicker, in my opinion. But yeah. reading it, it says the harder you grip, the further it clears. Interesting. That doesn't matter to me. Well, it's, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, want, it, it, I mean, it's geared towards driving enthusiasts. It'll be interesting to see how it rolls out and which vehicles it rolls out on. I'm thinking not the EcoSport. I'm thinking it never goes. <laughs> I think it isn't going. Out. I think maybe, like, say, for, well, it's for 2018, it's 2022, cars, yeah, and it's yeah. just being heard about now, right? Yeah, I, 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 I don't it, think. But then again, Ford do these things all the time. They, we've talked before. I think this about is their the R&D, one yeah. exactly, and there's, there's a, it, it, it's just like looking for planets. It might not seem to do much, but yeah. the technology that comes about from it always gets us somewhere. Yeah. But they, they did the whole. Um, water generation from AC systems in, right. in, in their cars, and and how they could make sure that that gave a source of clear, clean, drinkable water on a drive, which is a fantastic idea. Absolutely. If you've got a, you know, you've got a trip across a few states in the US on a, in, a, in, a, in an RV of some kind, if it's a Ford with this system, you've got water on board all the time, as long as the engine's running. I'm, I'm pretty sure that I just read somewhere, and I didn't put in the notes, so I could be wrong on this, but there's one company that was making small vans yeah. that were good for campers, and they stopped making them. And I think the Ford is... The, the go-to now for making these yeah little, those e-class e-series yeah. e-350s and stuff they're great so. they look great and, and there's plenty of space in them yeah. they, they just have those thirsty engines <laughs> you've, got to get over. you've got to get away from these guys and this is the problem right because the thirsty engines even in North America record gas petrol prices yeah prices have gone up here like thir- the thirsty engine just we, we even notice it because in, in the time that we've owned our vehicles from 2008 till now they're thirsty vehicles yeah and you know, it's it's almost cost me two hundred dirhams to fill up the tank, and it's like really. Well, the the Touareg from because I like to make sure I get all sure. the all the fuel out before I put fuel. You know, fuel fuel station roulette. You know, yeah, yeah. I, but oh, no, yeah. we always let's say the light comes on, and there's usually it'll say hundred kilometers left on the range or whatever. Yeah. Get it down to forty or fifty before we fill it, and it'll be like two twenty. Wow, to fill. Wow, I filled it yesterday with one hundred and sixty left on it, and it was two eighteen. That's, wow. a, that's a that's a rise. That's yeah for the month. That's the first time I think I've filled it in February. Wow, that's yeah. So, so. thirsty engines—they're an issue. Uh, here, another thing that that popped into and and this I, I it's, it's just a reminder it was the alarm bell going off, and not about this particular case. And this is in the U.S., but it just got me thinking that this is something we always got to keep our minds on. And this is airbags because you only know you need the airbag when it goes off because you've been in a yep. situation. And this is key in the U S they've done a recall, 410,000 vehicles. Are we ever going to get US. past these airbag recalls? I don't think so. And again, to fix a problem with the airbag. So I was just curious. I kept reading to find out, okay, because you know, what was the problem? And they, they were saying that the airbag control computer has a cover on it and the cover was coming into contact with the memory chip and damaging the electrical circuit that would stop the airbag from inflating. And it's just a cover issue. Unbelievable, yeah. And I'm thinking... We, we, we had a <laughs> Nissan Armada in on Sunday and it's a regular customer and he, he brought it in for us to do an annual sort of checkup on it and then take it for the test for the RTA. So we took it and did the... Did the inspection, passed its test, did nothing wrong with it, it's a good car. He went to register it and it refused to let him register it because there was an outstanding recall for the airbag, oh, which is great. Yeah, like yeah, the yeah. systems work. Like yeah, That's fantastic. Excellent. Well yeah. done, RTA. Amazing. And it told him, visit Arabian Automobiles, you have okay. an outstanding safety concern. Nice. And I said to him, it's almost certainly the airbag one. Yeah. yeah. I've never heard of anything else on the Armada. It's almost certainly yeah. the airbag one. The problem is he just spent 170 dirhams <sighs> on his yeah. test. Yeah. He's gonna have to get. He's got one. twenty-eight days. Yeah, they can't get him in. Really? Wow. So, so are they that busy with cars, or are they possibly a mixture of they're that busy with cars, but they've also not got the supply. Got, got supply, and maybe they're that busy with cars, don't have supply, so some of their their technicians yeah. are on leave. These wow. are these are yeah That's brutal. You know? So this is a this is a genuine issue. You know, it's yeah. an honest issue. It's not yeah, somebody's yeah. not pulling anybody's chain. This is a genuine problem, but. The system, it just goes to show the system's well integrated here. That's yeah. great news. But these airbag problems, I mean, wow. Yeah. It's, it's, one's not even finished and we get another one. And that, that's an, it's hard to say, therefore, whether that's a care issue, an assembly issue, or whether it's their supplier. 
because I don't mm-hmm. know who's assembling. They, they, Kia don't make airbag units. Right. They buy that from so, somebody. That, I don't know. Yeah. I'm guessing Bosch or Siemens or Samsung yeah. or whoever it is that make it. But they assemble it. Now, did they assemble it and then put the cover on it? Yeah. Therefore, that's their issue, and that's going to cost them big money. If yeah. it's the module that comes assembled with the cover on from the supplier, Kia aren't paying anything. Yeah, Kia are just footing this bill straight back to whoever they bought it from. Yeah. But if it's an assembly issue where they've put the cover on, then this is their, and that's a massive problem. Like that's, you know, and like I said, you just you don't. This is something you always got to be testing because. You don't know you need your airbag's not going to work until it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then it's like, yeah. how come the airbag didn't go off? Yeah. Oh man, I, I think one of those great safety items that we just never stop talking about because there's so many little things that can go wrong. It's such a sensitive system because it has to be. Yeah. That there's a lot of things people don't realize about airbags. So, for example, you get an airbag like fault on, it'll say something like there's an excessive resistance or whatever. It's usually nine times out of ten, an issue with an airbag is the actual airbag. Nine times right. out of ten. If there's an issue with an airbag, it's the actual airbag in terms of needs to be replaced to fix the problem. But sometimes you might get broken wires. But s- other times, the system will have a short circuit mm. and it could be in the airbag, it could be in the igniter, which is assembled together, it could be wherever it may be. Now, when you plug that into your computer, and there's so many people that have got these OBD scanners with yeah. an app on their phone. Yeah. If you get an airbag fault that says short to positive, do not press erase. Because if you erase it, it will test the circuit and it will put the power back on and it will ignite that airbag. Really? So I've seen it. I saw it. And it was the Master Tech. It was one of our Master Techs. I was still relatively new. But the lady that did meet and greet and made tea and coffee for people at the dealership where I worked in the UK, she had a Mark IV Golf and the airbag light had come on. And I think the car was still in warranty. It was. So it was in. Just have a quick look at it for us. Yeah. And short to positive was the fault. I can't answer as to why he did it. I don't know why he did it. I assume we just did a full run through of faults and then hit erase quickly. Yeah. Erase, bye bang. The driver's airbag and the seat airbag went off. So that was expensive <laughs> and those things are like you, know, you go yeah. people don't realize if, if the one of the things people worry about with airbags is that the the horn pad hits them in the face yeah. in an accident and it does and it breaks people's noses all the time blacks yeah. their eyes it's a lot softer than going through the windscreen or smashing yeah, the steering wheel of course you live you live with that exactly yeah. but one thing people don't realize is the dust <laughs> and the sound yeah it's loud we had a stunt so we weren't allowed to send airbags back under warranty but we had to send them we had to send them back, but we had to ignite them before we sent them. They're explosive and they can't be shipped. Yeah. So we had a stunt soft toy teddy bear that we used to strap to airbags and we'd turn them around outside in the in the yard and we'd like have 100 metres all the way around it and you just wire them up to a battery and short them. And then they'd, and like they'd clear the height of the building that we were in, the warehouse, easily. And then you'd like lose sight of them <laughs> can't like, see them and, then, it's whack. <laughs> and the noise is ridiculous and this is in a confine spe- like in a well built car you take like yeah. your Cadillacs or your German stuff that are soundproofed and really you're well ringing built ringing in your ears they're <laughs> horribly loud it's yeah. a, you know you live but you're so sensitive the systems are so yeah. I've never seen it but we always got trained never check the resistance of an airbag because when you check the resistance with a multimeter you're putting a very small current through it in order for it yeah. to work out that's enough to ignite it and people that don't know what they're doing will do that. Like I say, that happened to a master tech, wow. the guy that knew what he needed to know. Yeah. And oversight, bad day, press the wrong button, Next thing whatever. You know. There we go. Um, but it's airbags are super sensitive and you don't know. And one of the other issues is if you have an accident, the airbag isn't forced to go off anyway. Mm. Depends where you hit. Right. There's crash <laughs> sensors that have to be... <laughs> it's very possible your airbag won't go off at all. Yeah, you could have a serious hit from the back and your airbag wouldn't go off. You could have a serious hit from the side, it might not go off. It, 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 it all depends. They're, they're very sophisticated, yeah. very sensitive, but we don't really know how they're going to react because we don't know what the accident's going to be like. And yeah. what you can't afford is to know that they're not going to work. And in this case... yeah. 
hopefully for Kia, it's not their issue. But if it's a cover over the module, I would imagine that's an assembly problem. Yeah. So we'll see. Interesting. Frightening to know how they've worked out. Yeah. There must have been an accident where the airbags well, didn't go off. There's got to be a few. Figure it out. There's got to be a few that they've started to investigate. And I'm sure. I'm sure every accident looks at all of these different. things. Yeah, I think in the UK, it's a matter of one accident. Yeah. Is enough. And that's probably the same in the US, North America, I would say, yeah. and probably the rest of the world. One accident, let's say serious or fatal injury, it's enough to cause an investigation into that. And yeah. the brand will be involved. We've had, at VW, we had vehicles that were catching fire. Mm. Just one. Whether a driver had fallen asleep at the wheel smoking a cigarette, yeah, didn't matter. They had to come and investigate it. And we we had a fatal accident where the driver of the car hit somebody and said the brakes didn't work. It was rubbish because that wasn't the case. And we could read that on yeah. the control module. We could see he's fallen asleep or not been paying attention with one of the two. These things will be investigated and checked and it's due diligence and it's good that they get found, but it's just sad in the case that it's had to yeah. be found. Yeah, absolutely. Man, you know what? We didn't get to talk about the MG Cyber, Cyber Stir. They're that's, calling that's it the... <laughs> They're celebrating, MG's going to celebrate their 100th birthday, 2024. On their own. And they're going to celebrate. They're going to unveil a production sports car that will complement its SUV-focused model range. I saw the pictures of it. It's pretty pretty awesome. (laughs) It's it's made to appeal to a younger audience and build up enthusiasm around its historic name. We're going to talk about that next time, right? Excellent, excellent. And the Camaro. Why you talk about the Camaro, you like (laughs) No, because I just think, you know, you often talk about yourself, the you know, a, a, a in the blood VW guy, and yep. and DJ, your partner in crime, and in the blood VW guy, who drives no longer my partner driving that thing, a 2010 Camaro. No, <laughs> no. I, I've had to buy an S6 and a, an R32 just to try and cleanse myself. <laughs> So we're going to talk about that and 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 more. That's that's yeah. what we do. Yeah. On PowerWorks with Glenn Power from PowerWorks Garage, coming to you from the Rolf Hotel downtown Dubai's Epic Podcast Studio. I'm James Pikeaway. We're going to do it all again real soon. Thanks for listening. So long for now.